Hey everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. I'm Gabriella Handel, a draftsman and the host of the show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 39, and I will have this conversation with artist Kurt Cowper. If you'd like to support this podcast, liking and sharing this video is a great way to do it, and so is subscribing. These forms of support are immediate and have no additional cost. If you want to support the podcast with money, that is also welcome. And you can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, buying stuff I make from eBay, buying prints of my drawings, or leaving a tip. The links for these things are in the show notes. Thank you very much for watching and or listening, and enjoy the episode. Recording. <laughs> All right, Kurt Cowper, welcome to my podcast, A Conversation About Art. You are episode 39. Please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. So I'm a painter. Um, I live in New York. I, <laughs> excuse me, sorry. I paint, um, I'm a figurative painter. Mm -hmm. I guess that's as good a description as any. I. You know, I, my subject matter is very, so I recently done a series of paintings of men grooming. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing these kind of, I, you know, I call them fantasy paintings. The ones of the men grooming? No, ones yeah. of like, there's like a guy floating mm. next to a bus stop. And um, those are the paintings I've been doing recently. I mean, my the paintings I've done that I'm most well known for are probably these paintings of uh, of Carrie, new, new paintings of Carrie Grant. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the things I do. Okay. Um, okay, so so when, do you remember when you started painting? Well, I started painting when I was, um, or started painting seriously when I was 16. I mean, I had drawn my whole life, um, but Painting, yeah, I, I, I took classes with a, an artist in my hometown, um, a guy named Clement Micarelli. Okay. That's when I started. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so so your your painting medium is oil paint, right? Yes, always, yeah. Okay, so, all right, so then drawing and, drawing and painting are, would you say those are your main mediums of artistic e expression? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, Pretty much. I don't think I've, have I ever done anything else? I don't think I've ever done anything else. <laughs> okay. Um, why do you think that you, did you try several other painting mediums and then stuck with oils or you just started with oils and you didn't even, you know, you liked it so much that you didn't even bother with anything else? Yeah, I never bothered with anything else. I mean, the classes I took with that painter um, in my hometown he taught with oils, and then at Boston University, where I went to undergraduate, they taught with oils. Like I remember actually asking at Boston University what, you know, I was expecting to learn different mediums. And so I asked that question, and they said, no, we just teach in oils. Mm -hmm. And so that's really all I've ever done. And, you know, I've always, I mean, one of the main reasons I wanted to be an artist was I loved, um, you know, traditional painting, and that's pretty much oil painting. Of course, mm. you see watercolor um, and some other mediums, but you know, I, I don't know why I never branched out. I just love doing that. It's always that's always satisfied, you know, me conceptually. So that's always what I've used. Okay, and so how would you say then that oils satisfy you con uh, conceptually? Why? Because you know, if you started at sixteen, it's um, uh, you know how how long has it been? Has it been has it been a couple decades now at least that you've been using oil? So like, I guess it's been forty years. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. So then, why do you think, why do you think that it's been four decades and you're still you know what is it about oils? What is it about both actually, both drawing and oils? Why would you, if you could go a little bit into each one, what what does each one satisfy? Why do you think they have stuck? Well, it's probably as simple as the fact that oil painting, at least for me, is most amenable to creating the kind of highly resolved um, 
representational image that I want to create in my work. You know, I, I don't think it's really any more complex than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, there are painters who do that type of thing with um, acrylic or um, egg tempera, but first of all, I have no idea how they do it with acrylic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like there's that painter, Carol Funk. I have no idea how he can make those images with acrylic. I think it's really as simple as that, that it's most suited to that kind of image, um, which has always been the type of image I've wanted to do. And, um, you know, drawing is, for me, drawing primarily is a way of beginning a painting. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's in, a, it's, in, it's in a sense a necessary part of the process. You know, I do occasionally do a finished drawing and something like um, red pastel or graphite. Th those are not common parts of my work. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what what type of image are you talking about uh, when it comes to oil painting? What type of image are you talking about that is really well, you were saying just now that some people do it with uh, the egg tempera and um, what kind I mean, of image are you talking about? What kind of image in general? Um, cause you were, you were saying that, uh, you stuck, you think that you have stuck with oil because of the kind of image that you want to make, or I mean, is, yeah. is there a specific thing that you're trying to do that, that you, you know, you're, you're satisfied that, uh, with doing it with oil. So like, what is, what is it specifically like, is it the figure? Is it layering? Uh, you know, what, what is it that you? Well, I mean, you know, to put it like in the most commonly used word, it would be realism, right? Like highly polished. Oh, uh, okay. I mean, I don't like that word. I, I think realism is such an imprecise word, but you know, and it's often associated with photo realism. But you know, like a kind of highly polished, illusionistic painting with a strong emphasis on the representation of volume. Um, you know, a, a strong emphasis on representation of light on volumes. Those are all things that are part of my images, and my, for me, oil painting is best suited to creating that kind of image. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you care for the term realism? Just because it doesn't, um, you know, it's so imprecise. What do we mean by that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's a word, you know, it's a word that's sometimes associated with artists like Corbet, in other words, you know, and that's famously, I think that's famously what the word was coined for artists who are making paintings of things that we might actually see in our mm. everyday lives. But, you know, what is, you know, if we're calling an image realism, does that include everything from, you know, Van Eyck to, to what? You know, like, what's, what does it include? It just doesn't tell us much about what it includes or what it might include. Um, so, I, I just don't think it's that descriptive. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure any other word is that descriptive either, but. Yeah, yeah, no, but um, I think I understand what you mean because, um, you know, it doesn't make the, the, it doesn't differentiate between something that one might have painted or drawn from life, for example, um, versus something that is from imagination, but, but the representation of the things within that image from imagination, like are still, maybe like naturalistic in the sense that if I draw a figure from imagination, like it still looks the same way as a person in real life might look, you know, like it doesn't make the desert, you know, in, in that sense, at least it doesn't make the decision of whether an image is made from life or from imagination, but still uh, rep painted or drawn in a realistic or naturalistic sort of way. Yeah, I mean, sure. Right. It doesn't make that distinction and it doesn't, um... You know, and then, you know, I mentioned Van Eyck a minute ago, you know, Van Eyck's, you know, that the word realism could be used to describe, describe Van Eyck's paintings, but there's nothing very realistic about those paintings at all. Mm. You know, they're, su they're such bizarre, um, you know, very tightly rendered, but very bizarre, re you know, reimaginations of what the world looks like. Mm -hmm. So I just think it, you know, it doesn't tell us much about the painting in the end. Uh, okay, so I know you said, I mean, you said just now that uh, finished a drawing is a rarity in your practice, but what 
constitutes then in your, you know, within your practice, what constitutes a finished drawing when it does happen? What makes a drawing finished? I guess for me, um, really a finished drawing, I guess I just mean something that I intend as a final work of art, you know, um, being preparatory for something else. And that would be one definition. And then, you know, I'm very interested in the representation of volume, like a palpable representation of volume. And so, which is a little bit different from, or is different, they, it's different from rendering. You know, rendering and volume can coexist, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you like so a drawing that you know palpably represents volume and space. That's you know, part of a finished drawing. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is though the why? Um, and I agree with you about the difference between rendering, you know, developing a developing a drawing and conveying volume in a in a, an image or you know painting or drawing. But I'm not sure that I could explain the difference between those two things. So what what do you think is the difference between? Yeah, well, it'd be hard to explain. It's easier to show, like if you have two drawings side by side. Mm. Um, but you know, I, I mean, I'm interested in the palpable representation of volume because it's actually something that artists don't do much anymore. You know, I'm not, and I'm not saying that's evidence of a decline in art, I mean, artists don't do it much anymore because it's just not that important to many artists. Mm. But um, the representation of volume, palpable volume? volume. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. And the other reason artists don't do it anymore is artists, you know, we, I think we all in one way or another think about representation as somehow in, in relationship to the photograph, right? Just because mm. we're culturally conditioned to think that. And, um, a photograph really doesn't represent volume very well. I mean, sometimes when, you know, all of the conditions are exactly right, when the photograph is taken, it can represent volume. But a photograph generally doesn't represent volume very well. So there's actually a, a I think there's a, 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 a shift away from the representation of volume in arts, you know, starting around 1850, um, even in, so-called realist artists, um, unless the artist explicitly attempts to do it. That, that just sounds obvious. But what I mean by that is artists, even after 1850, who are attempting to make very convincing, quote-unquote, realistic paintings and drawings, often don't often make paintings or drawings that don't convincingly show volume and space because in one way or another, their ultimate reference for representation is, is the photograph. Mm. Where before 1850, you know, it was just second nature to artists. Like, so you look at any 16th century, 17th century Italian drawing, you know, by even, you know, the most obscure artists and there's a completely convincing sense of volume and space. Mm. Where you look, for example, at a Bouguereau drawing and there's very little depiction of volume and space. Uh -huh. Because um, you know, Bouguereau was essentially thinking about representation as a competition with the photograph. Okay. Um, and a lot of, and I think that that's true of a lot of atelier drawings nowadays. There's not, you know, they, they make all you know, they have all the elements of traditional drawing, and they have all of the elements that you think ought to add up to volume and space, like light, light shadow, you know, all those elements of light and shadow. Uh, they even conceive of, this, of the figure as a geometric structure conceptualized in a perspective space. But ultimately the drawings are are renderings of tone across the surface and don't really convincingly represent volume and space. You know, I've seen exceptions, but by and large, um, atelier drawings nowadays, uh, they reference photography 
even though they're not working from photographs, which is a, which is a very mm -hmm. strange thing about the way we are so deeply conditioned um, to think about representation as being based on the photographic image. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, it does make sense. Mm, I can see what you're saying, and uh, I feel like it would be really difficult for uh, you know any art an artist individual to try to, in that case, convey volume like you're saying without thinking of the photograph because uh, we kind of, I mean, I suppose unless a person is very isolated from uh, what, you know, quote unquote civilization or whatever, I mean, unless the person has never seen a photograph or has ever come in contact with a, ca uh, a camera or a photograph or this kind of stuff, or, you know, screens maybe even, uh, I can't imagine a person making work without thinking of photography. Um, well, I think it's possible to, but I think it's possible to step out of that condition. I don't think that it's, you know, I, I, I don't think that, um, you know, it's irresolvable. Hmm. Um, but you have to just be consciously you have to be, you know, when you're making a representational drawing or really any kind of drawing that includes volume and space, you have to be hyper conscious of the fact that you're trying to make a flat surface appear to be something that's not a flat surface, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where most representational drawing, the artist is trying to make a flat surface look like another flat surface, which is the photograph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so I think it's possible. You just have to be very conscious of that, that that's what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that sounds that sounds really difficult because I mean I um Yeah, I mean that just sounds really difficult. Um can you think of an exa uh, of a, you know, contemporary example of work that successfully depicts volume? Um yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, you know, like in, in her own way, in, in a very simplified way, Lisa Scavage does. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think Curran does in his, you know, in, in a lot of his work. Um, so. Uh -huh. Okay. You know, I mean, I, it, but it, and it doesn't have to be traditional realism either. It can certainly be, um, you know, Nicola Verlato does it um, in, his, in his painting. Um, you know, I, you know okay. I thought a lot about this. Go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, I was, I, I just said I'm writing the names down. I also, I thought about this a lot when I saw the de Kooning show because actually de Kooning does it. Really? Okay. De Kooning does it in you know, I think that's something that makes him a really interesting um, abstract expressionist in that he, you know, if I realized, I was looking at a specific painting of his at, at the Tukuni show, I, I guess that was 10 or 15 years ago, the big retrospective at MoMA, at Woman Number no. 3, which is my favorite Tukuni. And, um, you know, I, I realized that in spite of, you know, all the all of the first things we notice about a Tukuni, like the the, um, you know, the vitality of the mark making and the emphasis on gesture and, um, you know, the emphasis on, you know, what was called action painting at one time. Mm. The paintings are actually incredibly structural and incredibly spatial. And, um, you know, so it doesn't have to be constructing an image that has volume, structure, and space. It doesn't have to be a, a realist image. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but we usually think of it as as being part of a realistic image. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let, I want to talk a bit more about your personal work. Um, what would you say your work is about? It's funny. I was just. Um, I was just my gallery. Um, just sent me a proposed, like a proposed bio. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, I did some editing of that bio. 
I mean, not not to not answer your question, but I, you know, lately I've been thinking a lot about how difficult it is to say what an image or an object is about. If we're talking about like what what it means in any kind of precise way, I mean, and in that way, I've been thinking myself lately as a kind of as more a kind of formalist. Um, you know, when I'm when I'm making my paintings, well, so I'll I'll just. So I'll, I'll describe. Let me let me answer that question in an indirect way. So um, when I, you know, I said earlier that the work that I'm often most known for are these new these paintings of Cary Grant New, and um, the way those paintings came about. And if anyone is listening to this, I mean, if you go to my website, which is KurtCalper.net. You can see those paintings if anyone's interested. Um, I, I was, I had just fi finished a series of paintings of imaginary opera divas, and I didn't know what I wanted to do next. So I was thinking of all kinds, I knew what I didn't want to do. So I didn't want to do paintings of women, I didn't want to do paintings of figures against unmodulated backgrounds. Um, I wanted to try to make a, a contemporary portrait of, of a figure in. A, like an articulated space, in other words, some kind of interior. But I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, and it, it just occurred to me, and I don't even know why, or I don't know exactly why, it occurred to me to do Cary Grant New. And, um... Again? I, what's that? To do Cary Grant New again? No, no, back back then. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know where that came from. You know, other than to, I mean, I had over the previous like five years been watching a lot of Cary Grant movies, and I really love Cary Grant. But you know, I love a lot of things, mm -hmm. and I watch a lot of movies, and it just occurred to me to do Cary Grant nude. And to me, it seemed like a, a great, not a great idea, but it seemed like an idea I would really enjoy, you know, making a painting of. And um, I. Um, Sorry, and you know, I thought it was, it seemed funny. Mm -hmm. And then I also, you know, I think I was thinking at the time, you know, I, I, I was in Europe at the time, but I thought of this and I had been looking at, you know, some of my very favorite paintings. So I was looking at David's of the Horatii, which I love. And um, I was really, you know, standing in front of that painting, I was really struck by the fact that that painting is both very convincing but from our point of view, you know, in, in time, you know, looking at that as a 21st century viewer, there's something absurd about that painting too, right? Like the poses are absurd, the kind of heroism that's in the painting is kind of absurd to us, like it could not be. But it's still a very convincing and just incredible, overwhelmingly mm -hmm. beautiful painting. And I, and I liked, so when I thought of the Cary Grant paintings, you know, having just and looking at and thinking about the David painting, I like the idea that the Cary Grant painting would probably come off as ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The David, but I, I wanted, I like the challenge of, of at the same time somehow making it convincing. Um, and so I just went with that idea. Like I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do before that, and then that idea, and then I came up with that idea, and to me it seemed great. Okay, so like I'm doing this painting of Cary Grant, and um, you know, at the t at the time I was doing that painting, it was when artists like John Curran, Lucia Scavage, Elizabeth Payton had, you know, really become sort of they had become major contemporary artists. You know, a lot of attention was being paid to them, um, and you know, so there was an emphasis on the nude nude figure again. But almost all of the nudes that would be, at least the ones that were being discussed in our discourse were female nudes. Mm. And so I liked the fact that I was doing male nudes. You know, I, mm. I didn't want to paint female nudes because it just seemed like all other artists were doing that or um, you know, other figurative artists were doing that, at least the ones being paid attention to. Um, and, and then I became, and then I liked the way my painting got at or, you know, or alluded to sexuality, you know, I've always been interested in 
sexuality as a spectrum. And, you know, I like the way the painting, at least in an indirect way, kind of, again, sort of hinted at or alluded to that subject matter or touched on it, if I can put it that way. Um, I, I liked, I've, I've always been interested in, in paintings. I've been interested in the representation of desire and how that, but specifically how that, um, how that prompts the viewer to think about or consider not just their own desire, but the desire of the artist making it, making the painting and whether that's where it comes from. Like I've never wanted to make paintings that are just like straightforward depictions of what I desire in the world. It just doesn't mm. seem interesting to me. So, you know, all of those things were sort of after the fact ways of thinking about the painting that I was interested in. You know, that those were things that came up and um, those were kind of like a fringe benefit of the initial idea. But, and, you know, and that's really what how my work develops. Like, I, I don't, my work is not an idea, and then I think about the best way to execute that idea. So it's really hard for me to say that my work's about something. And I don't, you know, I, I think that it, it's hard enough to say what our words or what our language is about. But it's, mm -hmm. and it's not that much harder to say what, um, objects or images are about at least for me i'm suspicious of objects or images having a meaning in that sense i mean i know people want them to you know like i've recently i mean this always i always take note of this but i recently read um artist statements by two contemporary artists who are very well regarded right now uh, i won't say who they are mm -hmm. um but you know, and they were talking about what they they wanted their work to be about. And it just struck me that these are both figure painters, younger than much younger. It just struck me that, well, the work isn't really about that because you're not working in, a, at least for me, it's not, because you're not working in a communicative idiom that, that's reducible to precise expression. Um, you know, and I think that the, 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 the thrill and the richness and the importance of art is that it's not reducible to precise expression. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, I mean, does that mm, speak, I mean, does that refer to different images being it being possible to interpret imagery in different in different ways. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. So then. All right. So, uh, Mr. Cowper, then what is art in your opinion? Um, you know, there's a. a I love. There's an essay by a, a writer I love named Victor Shlovsky, who was a. Uh, he's a associated with Russian formalism. Mm -hmm. And um, he, uh, sorry, I'm gonna, I hope my dinging phone isn't annoying. I just turned off the dinger. Um, he wrote an essay called Artist Technique. And in that, and I, I think he does a great job in that essay of describing why we value art. So he, he in the end, he, ultimately says that we, we value art because art, basically he says it's because art, when we experience a work of art, the work of art estranges the world. In other words, it makes the world that we are experiencing strange, right? Okay. And um, not strange in any kind of conventional way, like spooky or weird. I don't mean in that way, although I suppose that can be part of it. But what he means is that typically we, we go through the world in a habitual and sort of automatic way. Mm -hmm. And art um, pulls us out of that automatic or habituated way of experiencing the world. And to me, that seems right. I mean, that's, I feel like that is what art does. 
Okay. Okay, so then does that mean that... Um, So, so that means that, uh, you know, we are very familiar with the world and we basically take it for granted and that nothing is like, you know, we don't pay attention to anything or whatever. And then looking at artwork um, kind of makes it makes makes the world we take for granted new again in the sense that it's no longer taken for granted. It's like, oh, you know, I didn't know that that, that this could, you know, find fascination. I'm looking at looking at it as if it was the first time or just not, you know, not take it for granted when we look back at our you know, after looking at the image, then we look back at, you know, our daily life or whatever, and it's suddenly not taken for granted. I it's like refreshed. It, yeah, I think, that, I think that's all right. I mean, he, he, he makes a distinction between seeing, which for him is, a, is an intense activity, and what he calls merely recognizing, which is mm -hmm. a kind of passive, you know, which is a kind of passive way of experiencing the world. And, um, but I think the way you lost it, I, I would say that's all, that all seems accurate. And I do think art does that. Okay. Um, but then in that case, what, but then what is art either way? Because I mean, so this is a description of what the capacities that art has upon a viewer. So then in that case, like what, what is the, object of art, you know, what is, what would you say is the definition of the art object itself? Or... I guess, I guess anything that does that, provides okay. that experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay, so then it seems like by that argument, <laughs> anything could be art in some way. Probably, but most, I think that's true, but most things are. Mm -hmm. Anything could be, but almost nothing is. Okay, okay. You know, and almost always the things that do that are things where an artist has attempted to, to create that situation in one way or another. Yeah, I guess there is a difference between somebody, on, you know, an artist arguing that their work can do that and then whether it actually does do it is another thing. Right. I mean, that's, uh, that's what I would love my work to do. Whether or not it does that, I don't know. That's for other people to decide. Um, that's, you know, I guess, of course, what makes making art that's genuinely moving so difficult mm. and rarely achieved. But we all try. Yes. Oh, I can say. So then, do you think that when you're making your work, your paintings or drawings, would you say, because, you know, like, uh, the, um, what art does is, uh, I guess, I mean, I was thinking of it as what it does to a viewer, but would you say that when you're working on something, do you, would you think, do you think that working on something can have that, the, uh, the effect that we were just talking about? on you, like, uh, you know, if you're working on an interior or if you're working on a figure, um, do you think that it has, working on that imagery and thinking about it and, you know, physically painting it and all of this, like the act of painting it, you know, using your body to make the work, um, do you think that it has, like, this renewing capacity of, you know, like, oh, suddenly you have, like, a extra appreciation for the human body somehow, like, when you're done painting it, uh, you know, working on the one painting one day, for example? I, you know, I hadn't thought about that, but I suppose it does. Like, and I guess, and maybe in that way, you know, like an artist, just the process of making art does that for an artist, whether their art is very good or not. I mean, I'm not totally sure, because I'm just thinking about that sort of in response to your question. Um, but I, yeah, I think so. So again, so, you know, that process of making art often does that for the artist. Whether or not it does that for the viewer is a different question. It's a related but different question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. That is true. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, you know, even though you tend to gravitate towards the towards the the male figure, why do you why do you depict the figure in your work? Yeah, I don't. Again, I don't have a really good answer for that, other than. You know, the art 
I love is often portraits or figures, the art I most love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I like, I, I want to make work within that tradition. Um, you know, and in that way, I'm very traditionally inclined. And really what motivates me to make art is, you know, this form that I love. So figurative painting or, you know, and I think it, I think we could say traditional figurative painting, even though that's not all I look at, but it's, that's the form I love. And, um, I want to be able to make work that, you know, both continues that tradition and then somehow modifies it, if even only in a modest way. Mm -hmm. that, I guess that answers the question. I mean, mm -hmm. that's why I do work with you. Um, are, you are you deliberately trying to modify the tradition? Or do you think yeah. it just happens? I mean, I, I think so because Although it, it's not like I'm doing that with every, I don't know. I'm not sure what I was going to say just there. Um, I do, yeah. I mean, I am trying to do that just because I, I mean, that's why we look at, you know, more than one artist, right? I mean, if all artists were simply conforming to, um, you know, the form as it existed before them, we wouldn't be that interested in different artists. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I guess there's two parts of that question, or two parts of the answer. So, so yeah, I mean, I do think it's important for artists to be conscious of, or to ask themselves, you know, how how are they modifying this form they're coming out of? And I, I really think all artists do that in one way or another. Um, but then I do think, so this, uh, I hope this doesn't sound like it contradicts what I just said. I do think that artists inevitably, you know, because of their own sensibility, their own background, their own histories, you know, even the way their body is physically constructed, you know, they're going to be making, they're going to be modifying any form they're working on, working with. And so that will lead to, you know, that may lead to those differences too, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the differentiate differentiation between people making work is kind of inev inevitable because it's like if you're just going, I mean, because otherwise it would be basic, I mean, either plagiarism or forgery yeah. if you're going to make it exactly the same way. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think you have to try really hard to make work that looks just like somebody else. Mm. Yeah, if it, it, in a way that almost requires more effort. Um, I often think of the differentiation in style between people as uh, handwriting. Yeah, there's that, for sure. Yeah, it, yeah, and, and I just feel like that is more natural in a way, because if anything, it's like more, it's like, you know, uh, you know uh, I don't know if you did calligraphy when you were learning to write, but I did that to some degree when I was learn, learning to write, where, you know, you have like these notebooks with the lines and you're supposed to like imitate the, the cursive yeah. letters. Um, and that, I mean, it might be in part because I was learning, but then at the same time, I mean, if I was to do that now, then copying the lines exactly is quite difficult because obviously one one uh, slightly different curve then just makes a different a different form, so then a different uh, shaped letter. So I I think I agree that uh, copying previous st any other style or uh, is really rather difficult, and uh, a person's own stylistic. Uh, language uh, is it's easier for that to come through um, yeah I, I mean and I think that can be part of, of what we're talking about I also do think that you know I do think that it's in it's in addition to that it's important for an artist to ask themselves you know why why are they using this form at this moment in time like how are they contributing to the long discourse of whatever medium or whatever art form it is that they're using. Right. You know, I, you know, I suppose someone doesn't have to ask them themselves that. And um, some people s dismiss that idea. But I, it's important for me to ask that question. You know, it sounds very vague. Um, but I, 
one of the most important things that was said to me in art school was when I was at UCLA, which is where I went to grad school, I had a teacher named Larry Pittman. And um, in California, unlike in New York, the, the people I studied with had no problem at all with me working in a traditional representational form. Mm. But to them, it didn't necessarily signify a dead tradition, which was much more common in New York, I found, and Boston. Because I think in New York and Boston, artists are much closer to the European tradition, both geographically, but also, you know, just the tradition of New York painting. Um, so they're hyper aware of there being like a dead tradition and then this concept of the new. And um, I think that, I mean, for me, the California artists I worked with were less conscious of that just because California art, I think, to its credit, is more removed from the tradition. Or that's, certain, that's what gives it a certain character. Um, and so those artists had no problem with me working within that tradition. But Larry Pittman used to always say to me something very general. He would say, you have to ask yourself why you, a young man in the late 20th century, is working this way. So there is no like explicit instructions beyond that. Mm -hmm. But I do think that that's a question that an artist ought to ask themselves. Mm -hmm. It at least prompts them to think about you know, what they're doing with their form and ask themselves a series of questions that, you know, in the end, I think will help um, create an individual, um, you know, an individual vision in their work. Mm -hmm. Even if only modest. Okay. So in that case, why do you think that you're compelled to make work? Because, um, um, I mean, for, for myself, I, I'm like, just, um, infatuated with the figure, I suppose. And so much so that I tend to, uh, and Wade made fun of me for this, uh, just drawing floating things with no background, no composition, and centered and stuff like drawing. And I, I continue to have that, te that tendency. I'm aware that I, you know, like, I don't do like you where I place the figure in a space and then also treat the space and think about perspective in this stuff. I, I have that pending. I want to do it. I want to be able to do it at least. But anyway, the thing is that um, I am drawn to the, to the depiction of the figure uh, because I think the human body is great. And so, like, I want to talk about the surface of the skin, and I like anatomy and all that stuff. But, uh, so then I, I guess that's kind of why I, I mean, uh, arguably I could do it via sculpture or painting or other means of expression, but I guess because of the familiarity that I have with drawing, then that's why I tend, like, I have that bias. Um, but then I, I have the hypothesis that I make work because I want to talk about the figure. So why do you think... Why do you think you make art? Um, well, again, it, it gets back to that, to something we discussed about, you know, being in love with a tradition. Oh. And, um, you know, I, th there are probably many, many overlapping reasons. Um, you know, for, I suppose starting with the fact that as a child, you know, I was recognized as being a good artist and that was validating, you know, so that's always been part of uh, my identity. And that was something that I liked, you know, mm. just that the fact that this thing I can do for whatever reason somehow validated, me. that's certainly part of it. And, you know, so from a very early, from very early on, I, I guess because of that, I wanted to be an artist and, and because I loved to do it, I loved creating images. Um, I'm not sure I can answer why I love creating images, I just do. Mm. And then that led me at a certain point, you know, as a, when I was a teenager to fall in love with other artists' images too, especially those that, you know, the, the artists who could do the kind of things that I really wanted to do. 
And I've always just wanted to continue to do that because I love doing that. Um, and I, so I really think for me, it has to do with the fact that I love creating these images. I don't, I don't know exactly why I love that, um, but that's the main reason I want to, I continue to make art. Okay, and would you say that the, uh, because you've, you've mentioned the, tr the tradition of painting repeatedly, so would you, do you think, do you deliberately think about that or, I mean, do you, do you, th does the thought of the tradition of painting come up while you're making work and? I think about it all the time. I mean, I, you know, I'm always thinking about, um, you know, all of the painters I love are always in the back of my mind. You know, and I think that's both a something that's very enriching, but it, you know, it can also be a burden because you're so aware of this long history of other artists who have made better paintings than you. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, so there's a certain, you know, there's a little bit of it that's demoralizing, I have to admit. Uh -huh. That's just something that you have to live with. I mean, or at least that I have to live with. So, but, um, okay, so then what aspects of the tradition of painting do you think about? Um, so do you think about like the, uh, I don't know, like the journey uh, throughout the career of the artists? Are you thinking of like how they approached their painting on the easel? Like how they, uh, you know, like maybe the procedure of them, of them like mixing the colors themselves, like making their colors themselves and then like the way the, they layer the paint on the canvas, uh, preparing the canvas, like what aspects of the tradition of painting are you thinking about? Well, there, there are certain, I mean, on the one hand, I do think about those kind of nuts and bolts issues. I don't think about the artists making their own paints, um, but I, I do think about you know certain techniques that I've been able to glean from looking at other artists, you know, insofar as they help me. Like if I mm. can use those techniques as a way of helping me think about the best way to build my own images. I do think about that, but again, I think mostly about um, the images themselves, you know, mm. and how how moving they can be, both you know, whether that's emotionally or intellectually or in or some indeterminate way. You know, and I love these paintings because I'm moved by them. And um, again, I I want to be able to make objects that that also do that. You know, again, whether or not they do, I'm not sure. Um, but I want to be able to do that. So that's mostly what I'm thinking about. You know, and you know, I've never been inclined to work abstractly. I've never been inclined to well, I don't say to work three dimensionally. It's not totally true, but I've never done it. You know, I'm I'm in love with this tradition of making a believable, highly finished representational painting. And that's what motivates me. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, Mr. Cowper, then what is beauty in your opinion? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think that's a really relevant question still, even though people don't talk about it much. Um, you know, I actually was looking for very recent essays on beauty and i couldn't find any there were or i mean i didn't look that hard but nothing immediately came up whereas if you look for essays on beauty from the 90s there were tons of them there's a period where um critic and i keep thinking about and and writing about beauty again not that those are that convincing to me but um so what it, so I think that the idea of the beautiful in a work of art is really important. And I think what beauty is in a work of art is that, you know, that thing in, a, in an art object, whatever that may be, that makes you aware of the fact that you're seeing something that's going to alter the way you understand the world. So I don't think of beauty as conforming to any set of rules. And I don't think of beauty as fulfilling any kind of objective. Um, 
but I, I think of it just as being that thing in the work of art, again, where you become aware that you're going to be understanding the world a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And that can vary greatly depending on the work of art. Does that make sense? It does. And it actually reminds me of what you, when I asked you what is art, what you said in reply, in, in, in answer to that, because uh, a, according to the person that you were, um, uh, I, I don't remember his name, but how, yeah, about how a work of art, what art does is that it makes you stop taking for granted your daily life. Uh, sort of that's that's like that's kind of what I understood and it, it I feel like what you just said about beauty echoes that a little bit um, yeah, I in think a way. Related. yeah 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 they're definitely related and I also I also like that um, your thoughts on beauty uh, address that it doesn't have to be anything specific necessarily like it doesn't have to be a specific object it doesn't have to look a specific way necessarily um, because, uh, I think, I think beauty is often con conflated with the appearance of something, and that is really just a fraction of a facet of beauty, uh, cause, you know, yeah, sometimes it's, sometimes it's something that we look at, but it isn't just, that's only part of it, you know? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, and I, I would maybe go so far as to say that it's not even that important a part of it. Um, the appearance? The appearance, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember someone, there, there's a, when I mentioned all those essays from the 90s, um, and one of them is an essay by an art historian at Harvard named Susan Suleiman. And she, I, I forget the name of the essay. Um, but she, in that essay, she said something about beauty for her prompting a kind of discomfort mm -hmm. and, or a kind of, did she say discomfort? She said something like that, or it was a kind of annoyance. And um, I think that's right. You know, when you, because beauty can't, it can't reaffirm something you already know about the work of art. Right, because that's that's just the familiar. But it it creates a kind of annoyance or disturbance in your consciousness, and I, I liked that part of her essay. I didn't like what, what she said in other parts of it. Sorry. <laughs> um, Sorry, Susan. And um, you know, and that that at least for me was very, I feel like that's similar to the experience I've had with works I ultimately think of as very beautiful. It's often the beginning of a kind of new understanding of something. Mm -hmm. Like I, I remember for a long time, I didn't care that much about Warhol. You know, I, didn't, I didn't pay attention to him. I didn't dismiss him or anything, but I just didn't pay much attention to him. And then long time ago, I think this was the early 2000s, there was an Andy Warhol retrospective at either the LA County Museum of Art or MOCA, it was probably MOCA in Los Angeles. And I and one of his paintings, um, it's called um, Closed Cover Before Stripe, one of his early paintings on a matchbook cover. And I just remember not, not knowing what to make of it, but also not being able to sort of move beyond it. Mm -hmm. It just held me. And there was there was a, a kind of annoyance or a kind of disturbance in that image, you know. And I started to think about it and deal with why that was the case. You know, I ended up really loving that painting, and I, I think you, I think beauty for me. That's how I would define it. that thing in the work of art that um, again makes you aware that you're seeing something, you're, you're, that the work of art is helping you see the world in a different way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I like that a lot. Um, the And, and also, uh, I mean, I have often, not just uh, through the conversations uh, that I've had in previous episodes on, uh, for the podcast, but I have definitely heard about beauty 
just disturbing people, terrifying people, and uh, stuff. Like, I heard that somebody, like, punched a sculpture in the classical something or other because they were just, like, so offended by it or something. You know, like, uh, jarred. They, they couldn't deal with the beauty of the thing. So, um, I think that, and, you know, back to what you were saying about how a work of art renews something that you were familiar with. It kind of, you know, the feeling un disturbed by beauty and uh, by the beauty of something depicted in a work of art in a way makes sense. Uh, and um, it, it only just, it's only making sense to me now because before I, I don't think it make, made any sense to me uh, when somebody said that, but it makes sense to me now because of uh, what you're saying because it's like, if, if the body or whatever it is is depicted in a way that is very new in an image, in the painting, whatever it is. It's like suddenly something that you were very familiar with is suddenly unknown again, in a way, because it's renewed. And it's as if you have never seen it before, so like suddenly you're not familiar with this image, with this object or whatever. Uh, you're just like the familiarity is remo removed from it and that, you know, that kind of sounds terrifying in a way. So like I kind of understand now, you know, it reminds me of a book uh, what's it called? It's, it's, it's a fiction book. It's called House of Leaves, I think it is. Um, and the premise, you know, part, part of the premise of the story is that it's, uh, I don't have to explain you the story, but the thing is that these people move into a house and they went for vacation and then when they returned to the house, the house somehow felt different. Uh, and they're just like, it's like a scary book. So they're like, scared by this feeling and they can't tell exactly what is different but something within the house the edifice is different and like that just starts shit starts to happen and whatever but then so like that idea of a very familiar object you know it could be your cell phone or something suddenly being some unfamiliar thing that you have not seen before in a way really does sound terrifying <laughs> because right because you're not you're not dealing with the familiar uh, that that sounds like a good to me. That seemed like a good metaphor. I mean, I don't think it's always a ter it's always terrifying, but I think that you can use that as a metaphor. Mm. Yeah, I guess it also depends on how a person, how each individual deals with the unknown, because it's and, and I mean, uh, you know, everyone deals with the unknown in different ways. Because it's like a person can sometimes be curious about, oh, you know. Um, this is new, or I hadn't thought about it this way. Or if the familiarity is removed for a person, that same person in, an, in another occasion, they just have a panic attack or something. Uh, so it really does depend on the individual, I guess, and the situation that the individual is uh, at the moment. Um, so like the, con the conversation in a way kind of renewed a little bit the way that I think of beauty, and I mean, not that I know what beauty is or anything, or I, I don't feel like I know what it is, uh, that's why I started the podcast, but I like the addition, or at least understanding that aspect, or at least having a hypothesis of why somebody would find beauty terrifying, or beautiful things terrifying, or made uncomfortable by it. That's, that's, that's pretty gratifying there. Okay, um, all right, so we have reached the 56 minute mark uh, in our conversation here, Kurt. Um, this has been really very enjoyable and it's excellent that I got to pick your brain about this stuff. Um, so please tell our viewers and listeners what you're up to lately, where your work can be found. Is there a project you're excited about? Do you have anything at all? You want well, uh, anything you want to add? Well, let me just say that I also really enjoyed the conversation and I, and Thank you for the questions. Um, so I had a sh I just had a show, or not just, but I had a show in March at Mark Selwyn Fine Art in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And I'm going to be working with um, a, ga a new gallery, a relatively new gallery in New York called Ortuzar, Ortuzar Projects. Um, that's O-R-T-U-Z-A-R Projects. And I'll be having a show with them in not anytime soon. Let's see when the show schedule for spring of 2024. Okay. We need a lot of time to put a show together. So, Lots um, of time to make paintings. Yeah. So that's the next, that's my next show. Okay. Well, lovely. Um, 
I do hope that you'll be posting about that. I expect you seem to be pretty good about posting. Yeah, I'll be posting that stuff. all that information. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Kurt, very much for joining me. Thank you for your time, your words, and your thoughts. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Feel free to let Kurt and I know what you think of this conversation in the comment section. Also, I invite you to, to subscribe to my audiovisual channel because more of these conversations are coming. I also invite you to like this video and share it with any and all pertinent individuals. If you want to support Kurt, myself, this podcast, or all three, the links will be in the show notes. So thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Bye.